just to be back at Victory Outreach. Man, I'm so excited to be here this morning. How many love your church? How many are thankful for your church? I say with pastors like you have, it's got to be easy to love your church. It's easy to have a heart for the house when you know the house has a heart for you. And, uh, and I tell you what, they just want the very best for you. I'm just honored to, to call them friends. And thank you guys so much for letting me hang out with you. I love all that God is doing. I love 2019 a year to build. How many want to build a stronger family this year? How many want to build greater finances in your life this year? How many want to see God build his church this year? More people get saved this year. And then we're going to build it. We're going to add on and build the building, redo. I mean, we got all kind of building to do. And here's what I have found. Life goes better when you put God first. And, and we're, if we're going to really build the way we want to in our lives, in our businesses, in our church, in the building, I think one of the things you have to do is put God first. And how do you do that? I think one of the best ways to do that is to plant yourself in God's house. The Bible says when you plant yourself in God's house that your life would flourish. How many want to live a flourishing life? I mean, yeah, you want to be happier than you are right now, healthier than you are right now, more love in your home than you have right now, more joy than you have right now. Plant yourself. How do you plant yourself in God's house? Well, one of the ways you do it is to show up. Look, you're doing good right now. You're already here. You see, just by showing up today, when you walk out those doors, you can say, Father, I thank you this week. My life's going to flourish. My business is going to flourish. My relationships are going to flourish because I'm choosing to plant myself in God's house. There's no better thing you can do to plant yourself in God's house. Oh, uh, uh, show up, um, pray for your pastors. That's another way to plant yourself in God's house. Uh, find, a, find a place to serve. That's another good way to plant your. Be faithful and generous in your giving. That's an, how many like giving? Let me see if you like to give. Okay, that's about most of you. I mean, we kind of can't help it, right? It's just kind of the way God made us because he created us in his image. And God loved the world so much that he gave. He, gave. he is a giver. So that's why it's kind of natural for us to want to wanna give, to want to wanna do things in life. I mean, we're talking about this new building, and my goodness, it's going to cost 400, half a million dollars, something like that. To, we got to raise to do all that. Well, how many like to be able to go, hey, uh, Pastor, put me down for 50,000 of that? How many, listen, what I said, how many would like to be able to? <laughs> They're like nervous. Is this a pledge? What is this? I'm saying, how many would like to be able to do that? That's all I'm asking. <laughs> People are, are they giving us envelopes? What is going on here? I'm just saying, we, our heart is to give. I mean, if we could, we'd say, I'll take care of the whole thing. Just uh, to get, let's get that done, Pastor. We got more people to reach. It's not about just the building. It's about touching more lives, reaching more people. And <laughs> I heard about a church got a phone call, and the receptionist answered the phone. The guy said, I'd like to speak to the head hog at the trough. <laughs> the assistant said, excuse me, do you mean our pastor? He said, yep, that's who I'm talking about, the head hog at the trough. She's like, that's rude. It's our pastor. We love him. We respect him. We don't, we don't talk about him like that. Can I help you with something? He said, yeah, I heard about the new building, all you guys had going on. I just wanted to make a $100,000 donation. The receptionist said, uh, hold on one second. Let me, let me see if Porky's in. You know. <laughs> Here's the thing. The more blessed you are, right? the greater blessing you can be. And so one of the ways to really plant yourself and to see your life flourish is to be generous and faithful in your giving. I mean, the Bible even says in Proverbs, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. I mean, the Bible tells us how to, how to create an economy of blessing in our life. How many want to live large? Yeah, the Bible says it's real, it's real simple. To live large, be generous. In your giving, when you're generous, he, he causes you to flourish and, and, and to, to increase, become large. The word of the generous gets larger and larger. So I, I encourage you, be faithful in your, in your giving. People say, you shouldn't talk so much about money at church. I mean, that's the root of all evil, right? We know that's not really what it says. We're smarter than that in here. What, what does it say? The, right, the love of money. Money's not the root of all evil. Money is the root of Good vacations, right? That's right. Money's a really good vacation. Money. Uh. 
Someone that day said, you know, Dave, money's not the key to happiness. I'm like, that's true, but if you got enough money, maybe you get a key made. Yeah. Here's the thing. Money's not even supposed to make you happy. All money is is a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool. It's like a hammer. You don't have a good hammer or a bad hammer. You got a hammer. Now, what you do with the hammer makes it good or evil, right? I mean, I can take a hammer. I can build a building to worship God and did something really good with the hammer. With the same exact hammer that I built a church with, I could hit someone with and kill them. So with the same tool, I could use it for good or I could use it for evil. So with my resource, I can use it to build God's house or I can use it for my own selfish gain. It's really, a, it's really up to me what I do with it. It's like, it's like, um, like this. There, there's, a, there's a scripture in uh, the Bible. I'm trying to remember where it's at. No, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8 says that the, that the Lord would, would give you the ability to create wealth. I, I love that scripture because he didn't say he would give you money. He said he would give you the ability to create it. Now, what does that mean, the ability to create? It means ideas, uh, business opportunities, right connections. Uh, he gives you the ability to create it. Didn't say he's just going to give you money. A lot of Christians just sit around praying, got to give them money. They don't do anything. You know, God's not going to take uh, uh, Bill Gates' money and give it to some lazy Christian that just sits around all the time. And so you got to, faith without works is, is death. So he gives you the ability to create wealth. Why? To establish his covenant is what that scripture goes on to say. So he's going to give me the ability to make money so I can establish his covenant. What's his covenant? A lot of people think it's Deuteronomy 28. You'll be blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Let everything you do be blessed. Let everything your hands touch be blessed. And that's great. That's exciting. That's a benefit of the covenant. But that's not the covenant. That's not the covenant. It's like this, water pipe, a water pipe. In this building are water pipes. They put water from one end of the building to the other end of the building, from the bathrooms, wherever. What a water pipe does is it distributes water. The purpose of the pipe is to distribute water. The purpose of the pipe is not to get wet. The purpose of a water pipe is not to get wet. It's to distribute water. In the process of distributing water, how many know the pipe gets wet? It's not the purpose of the pipe. It's just part of the process. And in the process of me being a blessing, see, God blesses you not so you can be just so you can get blessed. He doesn't bless you so you can get a new house or a nice car, which he doesn't mind you having a new house or a nice car, but he blesses you to be a blessing. So the purpose of God's blessing is so that I can distribute blessings. My prayer every day, Lord, make me a distribution center of your blessings. Bless me so that I can be a blessing to others. In the process of being a blessing to others, how many know you get blessed? That's what the Bible says. It's, part of the pro it's not the purpose of the blessing. See, the, 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 the covenant that he's given you the ability to create wealth, so God wants to help you do better financially. He wants to give you ideas, right connections, I mean, all those things so that you can create wealth, so that you can establish his covenant. His covenant is really in Genesis chapter 12. Where he says, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. So what God's saying really in that scripture is, I want to bless you. I want to give you ideas, creativity. I'm going to give you ways to make more money. Why? So that you can be a blessing. It's real simple when you think of it like that. I had a family member say, I, I, I said, oh, I wouldn't want more money. I mean, I, I just think if I had a million dollars, I'm afraid I'd be greedy. I'm like, that's because you're greedy now. Like, if you're greedy with a hundred, you'd be greedy with a million. But if you're a giver, if you know the purpose of it, God can continue to bless you. So I think of it like this. If you don't want, how many like to have more money than you have right now? Okay. I, I think of it like this. If you don't want more money, you're pretty selfish. I used to think it was selfish if you wanted more money. He must have self, he must be greedy, he must have, but no, if you really think about it, if I want to be blessed to be a blessing, to think you have enough is pretty selfish. I mean, we need half a million right now so we can keep growing and touch more lives and reach more people. So to not want any more would be pretty selfish because the more I have, the greater blessing I can be. And people say, aren't you ever worried you might get greedy? I, I, no, I, I think God put giving in the system to cure us from greed. 
if you don't want to be greedy, then keep giving. And the more you give, the more he blesses you. And the more you give, the more he blesses you. That's what he said he would do. And so I just keep giving. And the word of the generous keeps getting larger and larger. And God keeps blessing me. And it's amazing. These principles are all there for us to help us. And I tell you what, when you follow his word, it's amazing what he can do in your life. So uh, anyway, that was all a bonus. I got to get to my message. But uh, I hope that helps somebody a little bit. But uh, all, all, I'm, all I'm saying is get planted. That's what I was talking about, wasn't it? Tonight I'm going to talk about focus. <laughs> but uh, what I was talking about now was planted. And, uh, and so I encourage you to get planted. And I couldn't think of a better place to plant yourself than right here at Victory Outreach. And watch what God will do in your life and in your family. And it's, it's just amazing. The vision is great. And where there is no vision, people perish. So the good thing is there's a great vision here. And every week we see people coming to Jesus, marriages being restored and, and healings taking place and miracles happening. Why? Because of the vision, people are not perishing. But, you know, I think you could also flip that scripture around to say where there are no people, the vision will perish. And that's where you and I, people that believe in the vision that are a part, we make sure that the vision doesn't perish. Why? How? Through our giving through our serving, through planting ourselves and becoming a part of what God's doing here. And so I, I hope this will uh, just encourage you a little bit today, uh, what I want to share with you, because I think God's got good things in store for you. I'm, I'm just going to kind of share a little of my testimony, where I was, what God said, and, uh, and, and where I am today, and how this, this scripture has really, uh, has really helped me. Oh, by the way, I wrote a little book called Planted. And it's not a big book, it's, just, it's, not, it's a little book, but I'm going to give it to you if you're interested. I think they got a slide with a picture of it. And uh, yeah, there it is. If, if you want the book, it's not for everybody, but if you love your church, I would read this book. If you love your church and you want your life to flourish, it's just seven things you can do right here at Victory Outreach that will cause your life to flourish. Just seven ways you can plant yourself here. And like I said, chapter one, you've already got it, show up. But anyway, if you want the book, just text the word planted to 25827. It's my gift. It's free. I'm going to give it to you. Just download it, and you get it absolutely free. It doesn't cost anything. So people say, why are you giving it to us for free? Main reason is because I was afraid you wouldn't buy it. And I think you need to read it, so I'm going to give it to you for free because I want to help our church be everything it can be. And so it's my gift. And... Uh, I wrote it for our church, and it and just it blessed people so much. I said, you know what, let's just put it in an e-form, and everybody can get it. We'll just give it to everybody. And so it's my gift to help you. So I hope you'll pick it up. Uh, uh, my wife and son, they're not with me today. They are, they are out. My wife has traveled all over ministering. She's, got an, uh, she's an awesome preacher as well. I think they got a picture of them. Yeah, there they are. My wife's the one on the right. And uh, Christine. And uh, we've been married for 21 years. And, uh, and she is just, like I said, she's awesome, got an incredible testimony and just what God's brought her through. And then that's our little boy. Uh, you're talking about Miracle Month, uh, Miracle March. How many of you ever prayed for something, asked God for something, and it took him longer than a week to answer you? Anybody? Okay. How many ever prayed longer than a year for something? Anybody prayed longer than a year? Yeah, we prayed eight years, eight years for that. A little guy was trying to get pregnant. My wife just believed in God said that we'd be fruitful, multiply. And finally, my wife got pregnant. We were so excited, you know, and found out that the baby was in her fallopian tube. It was a tubal pregnancy and that we weren't going to be able to have the baby. We've been praying a long time, believing a long time. And, and, uh, and, and we just continued to stand in faith. And, uh, you know, we could have gave up. They, they scheduled the surgery to go in and remove the baby. Uh, just how they, they'd, uh, you know, what, what, what they do when, it, when that situation happens. And, and so we went in for the surgery just like they'd planned, but we didn't give up. There, we, I love those songs we were singing this morning. Uh, it reminded me of one of those old songs we used to sing, Whose Report Will You Believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. And we just stood in that. Anyway, make a long story short, they went in for the surgery and they said, someone's made a mistake, a uh, huge mistake. Your baby's fine. Your baby's in your womb exactly where he's supposed to be. And, um, you know, they, they called it a mistake and we just called it a miracle. And uh, she went on to carry him, you know, nine months and, and there he came out perfect, you know. Uh, well, he's not perfect. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, but. I mean, he's, and, and he, he, ended up, he was born C-section, you know, but I mean, you can't even tell from, from the pictures. He looks fine. So anyway, 
I told someone that day, the only way you can tell he was born C-section is when he leaves the house, he goes through a window. <laughs> okay, some of y'all get that later. All right, let me, let me, get, let me get, give you a couple things here I think is going to help us today. I think it'll be a, a, a blessing. If you got your Bible, open your, open your Bible up. Let me show you this scripture in uh, Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you've got a pen and paper, I'm going to give you three things real quick I think will help you. Oh, I brought my, uh, my new book with me, too, and I don't have time to talk about it. I was going to preach on this, but we're just kind of going to go a different direction this morning. But I'll just mention it. It's back there. It's not for everybody. How many have ever made a mistake? Anybody ever made a mistake? Let me see if you ever made a mistake. All right, maybe I should have brought more of them. Um, <laughs> listen, if you've never made a mistake, you probably never made anything. Everybody makes mistakes. The most successful people I know have, have the most mistakes, the most failures on their resume. By the way, tonight, if you can, rearrange your plans, change your schedule. Tonight's not for everybody, but how many want this year to be different than last year? How many want this year to be better than last year? Okay. If this year is going to be better than last year, you're going to have to do some things different this year. And I think one of the keys to doing that is to have a plan. I can go to the airport here. There's planes flying all over the world. But until I decide where I want to go, I'm still going to be at the airport. They don't sell me my ticket based on where I'm at. They sell me my ticket based on where I'm going. And so tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to develop your plan to get you from where you are. I was working with a, a small business owner, had a paint, painting company, had one truck, had a guy worked with him and his equipment in the back of the truck. But he had a dream to do more. Wanted to do more for his life, for his family, for his church, to be able to give more. And so we helped him develop a plan. I'm going to talk to you about some of those things tonight in, in, the, in the seminar at 7 o'clock, I think it is, 7 o'clock tonight. Anyway, I just talked to him. That he was doing jobs, $2,000, $3,000 jobs at houses and stuff like that. We developed a plan. He began to put the plan into, process, into, into plus. And the Bible, here's the thing. The Bible's full of plans. All the Bible is is a collection of champions who planned their success ahead of time. And if planning wasn't a Bible thing, I mean, in the Bible, there's plans for battle, plans for offerings, plans for building the temple. The Bible's full of plans. And yet we go through life just hoping it works out with no plan. It's a very scriptural thing to have a plan. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about how to develop a plan. I talked to this guy the other day. Now he has four crews, full vans, fully painted, wrapped with his company. They just finished a job, an $800,000, one job worth $800,000. Why? Because he said, I had a plan, and I put the plan to practice. So tonight, if you want to, if you want to plan for success next year, uh, this year to be better than last year, then get there tonight. But, uh, and some of that's in this book. What I did, I took a lot of the coaching stuff I did, and I put it together in, in this book. I got the title. We work about 50% of what we do is in the corporate arena. And I work a lot with sports teams, NFL teams, NBA teams. There's a guy that used to play up in, in L.A. He's retired now by the name of Kobe Bryant. Kobe, in 2014, set the record for the most missed shots in the history of the NBA. Isn't that an awesome record to have? The most missed shots in the history of the NBA. Now, what's amazing is seven days after he set that record, he passed up a guy by the name of Michael Jordan for the most points scored during his career. And they asked him, they said, how did you do it? He said, oh, it was real simple. I just took another shot. How simple is that? I just took another shot. You can't let the fear of failure or the fear of criticism keep you from trying again. We're all going to miss some shots. We're all going to make mistakes. You just get back up. I love what Evander Holyfield said uh, about in, on the book. And I, I mentioned this because I want to tell you this quote, not because I'm like, hey, I know Evander Holyfield. I'm not a name dropper. I'm just trying to tell you what, this, this, um, what, what the five-time heavyweight champion of the world said about my book. Um, <laughs> Seriously, seriously, I'm not. If anything I've learned from spending time with Oprah, it's, um, <laughs> so you shouldn't drop names. But uh, he said, it's not getting knocked down that makes you lose the fight. It's not getting back up. We all going to get knocked down. How do you get back up, get back in the game? Anyway, we've just brought a few of these. If you want to, I think if you've ever made a mistake, you got to get this book. It'll help you. And uh, what we do is every time you buy a copy of this book, our favorite thing is whenever you buy a copy of this book, we give a copy to an inmate. 
Someone in, in prison, someone in jail gets a copy of this book every time you buy a copy. So not only are you going to bless you, but you're going to bless a lot of people. We've given thousands and, and thousands of these to prisons all over America. And uh, so anyway, you'll be helping us help some other people as well. And we always do... Um, how many know someone you've been wanting to invite to church or you think would love Victory Outreach if you could just get them to come? And so what I like to do is the books are 20. Uh, if you buy two of them, you can get two for 30. Why do I give you the second one for just $10? The second one's not so you can split it with someone here. It's so you can take it and give it to someone you've been wanting to invite to church with you. And it's a great way. I picked this book up at church the other day. I thought you'd really love it. Give it to them. Your gift, the Bible says, makes room for you. Now it opens up their heart for you to invite them. Now you're going to bless them. You're going to invite them to come with you. Gave you a great way to bring up the church. It's all, it's just, it's, we've seen some great uh, uh, stories about people coming to church some, because of that. So anyway, grab a, grab a copy of those. They'll be a blessing to you. I don't know where, I think they're out there, and I'll be out there to say hi to you and, and whatever. But um, pick that up, and it'll be, a, it'll be a blessing. Tonight i got some more stuff I'll tell you about. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1. It says this, it says, now brothers and sisters, we want to tell you about the grace of God which was, has been evident in the churches of Macedonia, awakening them, awakening them a longing to contribute. For during an ordeal of severe distress, their abundant joy and their depth of poverty together overflowed into a wealth of lavish generosity. I like that. Say lavish generosity. Is that the same version I'm reading up there? Yeah, there it is. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily. Well, no one had to beg them. Begging us. They were begging us insistently for the privilege of participating in the service for the support of the saints in San Diego. Not only did they give materially as we had hoped, but first they gave themselves to the Lord. You know, we were talking earlier about life goes better when you put God first. You know, when you put God first, it's easy to give everything else. It's easy to put him first in your finances. It's easy to put him first in your relationships. It's easy to give yourself to the Lord. When you give yourself, Lord, everything else becomes easier. By, by the will of God, disregarding their personal interest. What? These people were crazy. They disregarded their personal interest and gave as much as they possibly could. But I got that money. That's for our cruise. We're going on vacation, and that we can't that we can't disregard our personal. Uh, I remember a few years ago, our church was doing a special offering for something, and I gave my cruise money. I've been saving that. I never really thought about it until I read the scripture, and I said, "Man, that's what I did. I disregarded my personal interest for the purpose of the kingdom." But here's what I've learned: what you make happen for God's house, God makes happen for your house. And so I started looking at this, and when I read this, I'm like, you know what? That's how I want to be described. As Paul described these givers, these people in Macedonia, I'm like, that's how I want people to describe me in my heart for God and my heart of generosity. I think this would be a great way to, to really talk. Man, what about Victory Outreach down there in San Diego? Man, have you heard about these people? My goodness. And we begin to have the same description. And so I, here's three things I'm going to give you that make it easy. I try to make everything pretty simple. And I, I only got a few minutes to, to share this with you. So number one, giving should cause us to celebrate. We should be excited when we get to give. Because we don't have to give. We get to give. We don't have to be a part of this new building. We get to be a part of building God's house. We don't have to be faithful in our tithe. We get to give back to the one who gave us everything. We didn't have to come to church today. We get to come to church today. It's a celebration. We should be excited when pastor goes, hey, we got an opportunity to give. We should all start cheering. And man, this is awesome. We get to give back to the one who gave us everything. For God so loved the world that he gave. Giving should be a celebration. Giving should uh, be an action that is compelling. And giving should demonstrate our commitment. So let me give you number one, celebration. Celebration. Verse two there, you see, for during an ordeal of severe distress, their abundant joy and their depth of poverty together overflowed into a wealth of lavish generosity. First thing I saw there was that they gave joyfully. They were happy to give. We know that scripture. For God loves a cheerful giver. Yeah, he loves a cheerful giver. That doesn't mean he, he doesn't love uncheerful givers. 
I mean, think about it. God loves everybody. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that having all sufficiency in everything, you would have an abundance to give to every good work. Well, what does that mean? It means every, time, every chance you'd have an opportunity to give, you'd be able to do it. I thought about this scripture. I was in New York City back at Christmas time. And you know the Salvation Army buckets? You know the red buckets that they put out at Christmas time and they're, they're ringing the, the bell, you know. You know how you do. You walk in the mall and there they are ringing the bell and you drop in some change, right? And then you leave and you run over to Walmart to get something and there's someone over there ringing the bell and red bucket. And what do you, what do you normally say? I already gave. Yeah, I gave some over at the mall. But I read the scripture and God says, I will give you the ability, the ability to give to every good work. Every time there's an opportunity, you'd have something to give. And so in New York, I, I saw these everywhere. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this. That Every time I see one, I'm going to put something in it. Now, you have no idea how many, of these, there's, there, how many of these there are in New York at Christmas time until you go. Literally every corner, I'm like, here's another. Oh, there's another one. I'm pretty soon I'm like, I got to go back to my room. Uh, uh, there's so many of those, but I just wanted to practice what the Bible said. How many are trying to do what the Bible says? And so well, I started looking for opportunities. Every good work. The grace of God. Here's what's amazing in this scripture we just read. We see that the grace of God is directly connected with our giving. So it have all sufficiency. The grace may abound. God is able to make grace abound to you as you give, having all sufficiency in everything. When we fail to see giving as a grace, what happens is it becomes a burden instead of a blessing. Oh, we have to give? Instead of we get to give? But see, grace, see, we, we, gotta, we understand grace living because how many thank God for some grace on your life? Yeah, my goodness, think where we'd be if it wasn't for grace. We know all about grace living, but what about grace giving? What about the grace that comes through our, our giving? And so we see here that they gave joyfully. It goes on to say they gave willingly. Like I said, we don't have to. We, we get to. It says they gave of their own accord. They weren't forced into it. They, they didn't even wait to be asked they saw a need and they responded voluntarily. It basically, they weren't drafted, they enlisted. They weren't forced to give. People make a lot of excuses. I don't want to give, I don't have to give. You know, it's not like we're forcing people. We don't have big ushers. We didn't find the biggest guys and put them on the end of the aisle going, <clears throat> no, pastor goes, hey, we got an opportunity. We're going to knock this out. We're going to build a bigger place. We're going to help more people. We say, how can I help? Not like, oh, yeah, but I got to do this next week. And then next month we were planning to do, we come up with a lot of excuses. How many know people that always make excuses? It's always someone else's fault. It's always, I heard about a guy great at making excuses, got pulled over by the police. The police said, your car was swerving a little bit. I'm going to need you to take a breathalyzer test. The guy said, officer, I'm sorry, I can't take breathalyzer tests. He said, what do you mean you can't take them? He said, I've got asthma. If I breathe in that breathalyzer, I may have an asthma attack. If I have an asthma attack, I could die. If I died right here, it'd be your fault. The officer said, okay, I, listen, I don't want to be responsible for that. How about this? I'm going to put you in the car. We'll go down to the station. I'm going to get a blood sample from you. He said, oh, he said, I would, but I can't do that either. The officer said, well, why can't you do that? The guy said, because I'm a hemophiliac. If you stick me, I start bleeding. Once I start bleeding, I can't quit bleeding. You'll stick me, I bleed. I'd bleed to death at the station and I would die and it would be your fault. <clears throat> the officer said, okay, fine. How about this? Step out of the car and walk down this white line right here. He said, oh. The officer said, what's wrong with that? He said, I can't do that. He said, why can't you walk down this white line right here? The guy said, because I'm drunk. A lot of people have a lot of excuses, right? But quit making excuses why I can't do this. Give, they gave willingly. It was an opportunity to give back to the one who had given them everything. It goes on to say there that they gave eagerly. If you read the full account, you'll see it was the people, not the pastor, that was begging for the opportunity to give. 
They were eager to give because to them it was a privilege to be a part of building God's house. To them it was not something we had to do. Perhaps maybe they remember what the Lord said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I like receiving. How many like receiving? Let me see. It's okay. You won't go to hell. So it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of part of the process. It's kind of like you, you can't say, I like breathing in. I just don't like breathing out. <laughs> right? To say, I like giving, but I don't like receiving, wouldn't, it doesn't work. Because the Bible says they go together. Giving and receiving. Sowing and reaping. Breathing in, breathing out. You got to have, they don't, they don't happen without the other one. That's why a lot of times when people talk about, you know, we want everyone to give a donation. I don't give donations. I don't give donations. When you give a donation, it ends with a receipt. After you give a donation, they give you a receipt. Receipts are nice, but that's not going to change my life. Yeah, maybe you can give a gift. Oh, gifts are great. Everyone, let's give a gift today. Gifts are great, but what a, after you give a gift, what do you get? A thank you note. I like a thank you note. It's kind. Give me a thank you note, but that, that, that can't change my life. A thank you note. What I like to do is I like to sow seed. Because when you sow seed, seed always ends with a, a harvest. Now, I can live on a harvest. So I, I, can, I can give, receive, I can sow, and when I sow, I also reap. And so here we have opportunities to sow. And when we sow into God's kingdom, we reap from that. And it's amazing. I remember years ago, I, made a, I had an idea. I wanted to give $100,000 to my church. It was a goal, I said. I wrote a check. I have a dream wall. Maybe I, if I have time to talk, talk about it tonight. I think I told you about it one time I was here before. But I have a wall where I, it's called my dream wall, where all I put on that wall are pictures of things I want in the future. Right? Most of the time, all of our walls are covered with pictures of the past. Memories. Nothing wrong with memories. Memories are great. But, my goodness, 90% of the walls in my parents' house are covered with pictures of the past. Memories. My high school picture, my senior picture is still up on my parents' wall. My goodness, I graduated high school good eight, nine years ago. <laughs> Our family vacation to Washington, D.C., still a pictures up. My brother's wedding, still pic the first one, still pictures. <laughs> Got pictures up on the... I got on the elevator at the hotel last night. This lady looked at me. She goes, you know, you look like my third husband. I was like, man, welcome to San Diego. I was like, my goodness. I said, how many times have you been married? She said, twice. Anyway, anyways. Some of y'all get that later. But anyway, so... I put a picture one day, one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give $100,000. So I wrote a, church, a check to my church from my pastor, $100,000. And so I got to work my way up to it, you know, right? It's like giving. It's like working out. You don't go in the gym and lift 500 pounds the first day. So I'm not going to give $100,000. I got to work my way up to it. Faith is a muscle. If you want a muscle to grow, what do you do? Exercise it. You stretch it. You work it out. And so if I'm going to get to $100,000, I start with where I'm at. I started with 500. I'll never forget. The first big time I really stretched my faith, I gave 500. It's like when you go to the gym, I'm going to bench press 500 pounds, put 100 on there, and let me see what I can do with that. So once I'm bench pressing 100 pounds, what do I do? Add a little weight on the end. Put a little more on there. Oh, now I'm up to 150. I'm bench pressing 150. What do I do? Add a little weight on the end. I'm up to 200. I'm just working my way up. One day I'm going to get to 500. I'm just working my way up to it. Right now I bench press, I don't know, right around 330. Or 4 o'clock, right, right around that time. But so one day, right, I'm gonna, I want to give $100,000. So what am I going to do? I'm going to work my way up to it. And I remember the first time I gave 500. Pastor got up. I remember this at church. My wife and I, I don't have time to tell you my whole story, but we lived in a, a little government-assisted apartment, you know, Section 8 housing. We were living in Section 8 housing. We didn't have a bed, had a little air mattress. We didn't have a dining room table and chairs. We just got married, just kind of starting out. And, and uh, Dave Martin International, <laughs> people laughed. as International, where y'all been? We'd never been anywhere. It was a small ministry. I did everything. You know, when you just start, I laid hands on people. I'd run behind them, catch them. <laughs> All by myself. That's a small ministry. And, uh, and so... 
here we are in that little apartment and, and pastor's up and we had this opportunity to do this thing with, with the church and he shared the vision and he said there's some people here that could give $20,000. There's some people that could give $50,000. Someone here could give uh, $10,000. He goes, there's many who could give $500. And I remember sitting on the second row over there thinking $500. Wow. I hope God speaks to them. <laughs> I didn't want to be one of them. And all of a sudden, I felt like God said, you're one of them. I want you to give $500. And I said, oh. <laughs> Shoot. Um, I reached for my wallet. I, pulled my, my, I started to pull my wallet out. About the time I did, the guy sitting next to me says, I'm one of them. I said, whew. I, I guess I overheard God talking to him. <laughs> so I put my wallet back in my pocket. My wife leaned over. She said, is God telling you anything? I said, I don't know, is he telling you anything? She said, I think we're supposed to give 500. I said, oh. I remember I got the envelope out. I was filling out the, the envelope and ink was smearing from the tears. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. People like, people say, you shouldn't cry when you give to God. I said, I'm not, I'm just watering my seed. But I remember giving that $500. I don't have time to tell you the testimony of what happened, but God began to bless us. The next time we were able to give $1,000. The next time we gave $2,500. Because here, here's the thing. If I keep giving the same thing over and over and over, if I just kept giving $500, it's like working out. And every year after year, I just keep bench pressing 100 pounds. At some point, I'm going to have to stretch myself a little bit. It's easy to go in the gym and lift what's easy, but that doesn't do any benefit. That's no benefit. The benefit is when you put something that stretches you, that causes you to push a little bit harder. And I think it's the same thing with my giving. I mean, my goodness, if I, keep, if I just do what's easy, I remember the first time I gave $5,000. I remember the first time I gave $10,000. I remember our church was building a youth center. It was going to be $3 million. Pastor wanted to build it cash. And we were all had this opportunity. My wife leans over one day. We're at church that, that night. They're talking about the pledges and, and the giving. And my wife leaned over and says, I feel like God wants us to give 25000 to the youth center. And I said, I, I don't feel that. <laughs> I felt 10. I felt 10. I'd given 10 before, and I had 10. And, and so it was easy. I could give 10 because I had it, right? It's easy to give it when you have it. You don't have to use your faith. You don't have to, you don't have to believe. You don't have to stretch at all. But God says, no, I want you to do something. Would you give 25000 I said, if I had it, I would give it. But I don't have it. He said, I don't ask you if you had it. I ask you if you would give it. Because he said he would supply seed to the sower. So that day I said, you know what, God, if you'll give me $25,000, i will i will do it. And I gave my ten right then. Why did I give it right then? So that it could start producing something for me. See, the seed, as long as I keep holding it, it's not going to produce. It doesn't produce till I put it in the ground. So as soon as I get it, like when I make a pledge, like I'm going to give 25000 as soon as I get some, I start putting it in the ground so it can start working. It can start multiplying. That 10 started multiplying, and here come an extra five over here. And, I, and a 1000 I wasn't expecting came over here. And all of a sudden, I thought, you know, where, where a lot of times we think we're getting harvest, when all God's doing is giving you seed. Because if it's not big enough to meet your need, it must be seed. I mean, how many, how many need more than $5,000 to pay your house off? Yeah. Or, or, or more than $1,000 to pay your car off? So it's not enough. So God just gave me seed, and we just kept sowing it. And it wasn't long. I can't even explain how it all happened. But we were able to give the whole $25,000, just working our way up. One day, we're going to get to the $100,000. And, and, and it was eight years probably before we were finally able to give the hundred thousand dollars. I never dreamed I'd have a hundred thousand dollars, let alone be able to give it. And so, oh my goodness, they gave they gave eagerly. I'm out I'm out of time. Let me just tell you, they were they were compelling. They gave uh, their giving. Our giving should be compelling. In giving, we grow. So by giving, we become part of something together that's much bigger than anything we could do by ourselves. So maybe someone here can't give half a million dollars. But if you give your best, 50000 you give your best, 1000 I give my best, 2500 If every one of us do our very best, all of a sudden together, now we've gotten, we've, we've fulfilled what God told us to do. We're moving forward. We're building. We're growing. It's remarkable and pretty ironic about giving 
you only really get to keep what you give. You only really keep what you give. If you think about it, at the end of your life, what's going to last? It's the love that you gave. It's the influence that you had. It's the kingdom work that you did through your giving. What remains is really what you gave away. Because you can't take any of this with you anyway. So you only get really get to keep what you give. So be, be compelling. Be compelling. They gave supernaturally, which means they gave beyond their ability. See, 20, 25000 I gave to the youth center was beyond my ability. My ability was 10000 but my faith and God's help supernaturally gave me the ability to give 25000 Why? Because I was willing to stretch. Say, God, if you'll bless me, I'll use it to be a blessing. It's, I love this. They gave unexpectedly. Paul wrote that they gave not as we had expected, which means at the end of the, when they counted the offering, he was like, whoa, I can't believe those people gave that much. Wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, next Sunday, pastor gets up and he's like, oh, my goodness, I can't. You guys are blowing my mind. We've got more than we need to build what, we, what we're going to build. And, and because we gave unexpectedly. I mean, I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to help us be what the Bible tells us to be. I mean, but if you don't want to do that, it's fine. How many want to be the kind of giver that God describes here, that used Paul to describe and then, and then the last thing is that they, they, their giving demonstrated their commitment. And that's what our giving does. It demonstrates our commitment to the house, to what God's doing, to what God's building. They gave sacrificially. It was a sacrifice. They gave personally. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I love that. Give and it shall be given. You know, when you give, what, what, is, what are you believing for? Because God told me years ago in that little apartment, if you'll build my house, I'll build your house. And I, and I saw the scripture, give and it. What's it? What do you want it to be? What's it? What are you believing for in your house? Maybe you're believing for a house. Maybe you're believing for an unsaved family member. Maybe you're believing for restoration in your marriage. Maybe you're believing to start a new business. When you give, every seed has an instruction. A watermelon seed cannot produce a tomato because there's an instruction inside the seed to produce a watermelon. Every seed has an instruction. A farmer wouldn't take seed and throw it and say, well, corn, beans, tomatoes, we'll see what happens this year. No, the farmer decides the harvest before he plants the seed. And I don't know what it is you're believing for, but I believe what you make happen for God's house. Name your it. God, this is what I'm believing you to do through my seed. As I sow it into your house, I thank you that it's coming back to my house. Breathing in and breathing out. It shall be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I love that part. Have you ever, have you ever been too lazy to take your garbage out? So you just pressed it down a little bit. Let me see your hand if you've ever done that. Why do you do that? So you have more room. Right? You can put more stuff in there. You don't have to take it out yet. I can keep loading it up until finally it starts running over. I can't push it down anymore. So I take the bag out of the can, and I found when I shake it together, how many found there's some more room in there? You still, you can put more stuff in there. And that's what God said. That's how I want to bless you. I'm going to press it down. Pour in some more blessing. I'm going to shake it together. Pour in some more blessing till it's running over. For with the same measure you give, that's how I'm going to give it back to you. So you have an opportunity today. You can give teaspoons. And God will bless you. He'll bless you with teaspoons. More teaspoons than you gave. It will always be more. He promised that. But he, I don't know if, if you want teaspoon blessings, then give teaspoons. I want five-gallon bucket blessings. So if I give in five-gallon buckets, he gives back in five-gallon buckets. If I give in wheelbarrows, he brings it back in wheelbarrows. With the same measure you give, that's how he measures it back to you, more than you gave, but with the same measure. How many want some five-gallon bucket blessings, some, some dump truck blessings? So it's up to you. The word of the generous gets larger and larger. You give generously, he gives it back generously. You give sparingly. You get it back sparingly. These are right there, simple principles in the word of God to help you create the economy. Say, well, what if there's a recession? I don't participate in those. I don't, I don't have to participate in those because 
I'm not going by the world's economy. I, I go by God's economy. And the principles are real simple. If I want to live by a different economy, I can follow these principles. Because they're going to work no matter what happens to the real estate market. The re God's word doesn't change based on the stock market or the real estate market. He says, look, if you'll do what I say, I'll open up windows of heaven over your life and pour out blessings that you don't have room enough to receive. Amen. Let me just, let me just pray for you real quick. And pastor's going to come. I'm out of time. How, how many got at least one thing to encourage you a little bit? Helped you a little bit tonight or this morning. And by the way, if you can, rearrange your plans and get back here tonight. Uh, uh, I'm going to do the seminar at 7 o'clock tonight. I promise you. I promise you. Tonight, I believe, is going to be a real major turning point for somebody. It's going to be a real major. So we're going to get into some principles. There's a big difference between the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. The person of Jesus prepares you for heaven. The principles prepare you for earth. And I'm going to share with you some principles tonight that I believe are really going to, going to help you take your life uh, and make this year your best year yet. So, Father, I just thank you for your word today. I thank you for what you're doing in our church. I thank you that we have an opportunity to be a part of something bigger than us. Every one of us have a part to sow into building your house. Some of us have already said, hey, here's what I'm going to do. And we did what was easy. We did what we had. Oh, yeah, I've got that. I can do that. There was no stretch. There was no opportunity for growth in that seed. Maybe you're speaking this. Maybe there's someone here. You, they, they said, you know what, I'll give 2000 But you're saying, you know what, I want you to give 2500 you know, I want you to stretch just to look, add a little weight on the end. Someone else may say, you know what, I'm going to give I'm going to give 15 But you're saying, you know what, God, you're saying, I want, you, I want them to give 25 I want to show them how I can bless them and they can be a blessing. I want to make their world larger because they understand this principle. I'm going to give them business opportunities because they've chosen to use it for my kingdom. Father, more important than any of that, the greatest picture of giving we ever saw was when you gave your son Jesus. You wanted a family, you gave a son. I'm going to look across the building one time before pastor comes, just one time. You know if this is you. If you're one of two people in this room, number one, you've never made the decision to put God first in your life, to receive the gift that he gave his son, Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. Or number two, if you're here, you say, Dave, at one point, God was first place in my life. But if I'm real honest, he's not right now. But I want, I want to put him back where he belongs. I want to put God back number one in my life. Number, he's never, you've never put him number one or number, or the second thing, if, if at one point he was number one, but you've allowed maybe a job, maybe a relationship, something to come before God in your life. But when you leave here today, you say, I'm putting God back where he belongs, first place in my life. If that's you, when I count to three, I'm looking one time. Just lift your hand real quick before I pray this prayer. And pastor comes, one, two, three, across the room. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you in the back. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. Father, I thank you for these hands that were lifted across the room. Lord, I thank you that you don't just give us a desire to change, but you give us the discipline to make the changes we need to make. You never condemn us, but you do convict us. But you said it's this simple. If we believe in our heart, say with our mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, we'd be saved. I want everyone in the room to say those words with me today. Say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. You talk about a decision that will make the rest of your life the best of your life. We are talking about the book, Another Shot. You know, another word for that would be a comeback. I tell you what, I can't think of any greater comeback you could make than to come back right here to Victory Outreach. If you lifted your hand, there's no greater comeback than come back here every chance you get. Begin to plant yourself here in God's house. And I promise you, a year from now, you won't even recognize yourself. Your family, get your kids in here. I promise you, it'll, it'll, it'll make your tomorrow different than your today. So I encourage you to get here in God's house. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Pastor's coming. I look forward to seeing you tonight.